You've been discussing the angas of bhakti, I understand. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the importance of kirtan, association, living in a holy dham, worshiping the deity, and I'm missing one. Sangha association, hearing Bhagavatam. Oh, that's five. I heard five, yeah. And we're asked to, to talk about sangha. Kirtan, yeah. The kirtan, yeah, kirtan, Bhagavatam, sangha. Living in a holy place, worshiping the deity. Yeah, so we're talking about Sangha today. Today we're talking about Sangha. And in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it says that Sangha is the root cause of, of devotional service. And I have taught about Japa chanting, and when you study the theology of Japa, you, you are confronted with the obvious conclusion that of all the processes of bhakti, Japa is the most important, but Sadhu Sangha is the root. So what is so like? Well, what's the difference? Well, Japa is the most important, but we don't have if we don't have Sangha, we won't chant because we won't have the support system. Everybody realizes that, right? When you think about, it. isn't it like okay, chanting is the most important, but how could I even do this without Sangha? It would be po impossible. So it's the root cause. It's foundational. Like I, I developed a course on self care. And by teaching the course on self-care, I realized that self-care is really foundational to doing anything, because if you don't care about yourself, then what's your motive to improve in any way? So we say self-care is the basis of good japa. So it's like, it's like a foundation below everything on which it's supported. You have to have a desire to want to be Krishna conscious, to care enough about yourself to want to be Krishna conscious, to purify yourself. So sadhu sangha is like that. It's the foundation upon which, which we build and I was just thinking of a story I wanted to tell you. Just when I sat down here, this chair revealed to me a story. Because I guess many great souls have sat in this chair and it's vibrating with, with Shakti. So this takes place at a Japa retreat. And what a Japa retreat is, we spend many days talking about how to improve our chanting. And then like the third day or fourth day, we dedicate a day just to chanting. And we don't do anything else. And we take a monobrat, a vow of silence. So it's quite easy to chant all day if you can't talk to anybody. Actually, if you chanted 64 rounds a day, you wouldn't have much time to talk to anybody. Um, so that's what we did. We took, we took a kind of like a vow that we would chant all day. And it was understood that you want to try to chant 64 rounds. So 64 rounds. That's at least, for most people, eight hours of chanting. So if, you, if you've never chanted for eight hours, you could imagine on the night before, you're thinking, how am I going to do this? This is going to be really difficult. Right? And many devotees think back like that. It's like, you know, getting ready first day, second day, third day. No, OK, tomorrow, 64. Could you imagine, Steve, 64? You know, it's like. For some of us, it's like 16 is like, whoa, I'm sweating by my 15th round. You know, this was hard. You know, so 64. So this devotee I knew was at the retreat, and I was one of the I was one of the facilitators there. And he came up to me the night before. He said, "I'm, I'm really nervous and anxious and stressed out about tomorrow. I've never chanted more than 16 rounds. I don't know how I can do this. It's just really." Concern. And I, I, in some way, pacified him. I gave him a meditation and so forth. So we chanted from, well, we chanted from 5 a, well, any time from whenever we got up in the morning till 7, and then after breakfast, we had class, kirtan, and breakfast, and after breakfast, we went till 6. So we had about 10 hours chanting. And then we meet back at 6 o'clock and we share our realizations. And he came up to me, Shh, I chanted 89 rounds. <laughs> I chanted 89 rounds. I couldn't stop at 64. Wow. And I have done this also, many retreats where we chanted 64 rounds. And I want to make, a, it's not really a vulnerable statement, I just want to make an admittance that I found in that sangha, when everyone was chanting 64 rounds, 
and nobody was talking, and we spent three days preparing for it. I actually found it easier to chant 64 rounds than I normally chant my 16 alone in my house without any sangha. Isn't that interesting? Those of you think, wow, 16 rounds, that's going to be so difficult, I can't imagine, I can hardly chant one. In that sangha, you have 100 other people, what are they doing? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna. Are they talking to you? No. Monavrat, silence. You've been hearing about japa, how to improve it, how to connect with it, who Krishna is in his name. For three days, from some of the best teachers, it was actually, I swear, it was actually easier to chant 64 rounds than that. Anyone have you done that before? At a retreat? You agree? No, but when you say that, I did at home. Yeah. It's easier at the retreat. But you can imagine. Yeah. But, but that's my point. It was actually easier. Isn't that interesting? So um, then I thought of another story. The chair revealed another story. I was... Somebody, because I was teaching about japa, somebody sent me a lecture or a talk from another devotee about japa. And this devotee, at some point in his life, decided he was going to chant 64 rounds every day. That was just his seva. I mean, you could do it if you get up like 2 o'clock and you just chant till 10. You, know, you can discipline yourself. That's how you do it. So he was doing it, and he was talking, maybe he was chanting 50 rounds. I think, he I think he was chanting 50 rounds, and he was talking about all these realizations he was getting, and, like, and, I'm, and I'm listening to this. I'm like, wow, wow, wow. It's just I'm getting That day, I had time, 50 rounds. It was, I'm chanting 50 rounds a day. That's the power of association. It, it, the, the power of association. Have you ever had this experience where you're like, you're kind of stuck in a rut, and you can't imagine like getting out of the rut, and then you meet a devotee who's like way out of your rut and very, very easily doing the things you want to do, and you look at them and you think, oh my God, that's not as hard as I thought. By seeing someone else doing it, it makes it possible for us, like with the four-minute mile. You know? They said nobody can run a four-minute mile because it's physically impossible. And then once somebody did it, I think that year, like 50 people did it, something. It's like... So when you see somebody doing something, it's like the thing that I thought was difficult becomes easy because someone else is doing it. You ever have that experience? Just by, you know. For me, and with my conditioning and where I'm at, I, I don't know how to do it. But you're doing it, and I'm like, well, you know, you're not like an avatar or anything. You're doing it. I should be able to do it. You know, we're, we're both human beings in the same conditioning, more or less. I should be able to. So um, that's the power of association. And then we just heard, if you want to be a millionaire, you have to associate with millionaires. And they say, the rich people say, the financial gurus say, your income will be the average of the income of your five closest friends. Isn't that interesting? Because it kind of normalizes you know, that amount. Because if I say, if I say, well, my income's five million a year, you're like, well, my income's like, you know, fifty thousand, or you know, that's like, like incredibly huge. But if all your friends are making five million, five million's like, oh, that I guess that's just normal. It normalizes it, right? All my all my friends get up at one thirty in the morning and chant thirty two rounds. You know. That would be interesting, you know. Don't you think it would be a little easier for you to, to get up earlier than you're getting up now if every one of your friends was doing it? Yes? Right. So, so that, that's the value of association. And when Prabhupada started ISKCON, his, well, actually, when Prabhupada came to America, it wasn't like necessarily had a vision to open lots of temples. His vision was to write books. And he always said, that's my mission, to write books. But what happened is Prabhupada was preaching. He didn't know what was going to happen. And people are coming. And, they, and once they were coming, well, they needed a place to come where everyone could meet because we need sangha. So they said, OK, we need temples now, right, to create sangha. It wasn't like the first plan. It was a byproduct of the preaching and distribution of his books. So temples were just really fundamentally created to give people a place to, to come to meet their tribe. 
When I first went to the temple, the first temple I went to, first thing I thought is, here's my tribe. These are my people. I, you know, I'm in a school, 50,000 people. I have friends and everything, but I went to the temple and said, this is my tribe. So that's, and um, at that time, I was 19 and it was a university town. And this university town was one of the most liberal slash degraded city college towns in this side of Brahmaloka, I think. You know, it was like pretty, it was really bad. <laughs> it's like, if you could, if you could live in that town and not break all the regular principles like 12 times a day, you'd be a sadhu, you know, it was really bad there. You know? So I decided I wanted to be a devotee. And my parent, I told my parents, they weren't so happy to hear that. And I said, um, that's putting it mildly, they basically had a nervous breakdown. Um, and I said, you know, I want to drop out of university. That's what every parent wants to hear, right? But now if you're smart and your kid says, I want to drop out of university, and your kid's smart and could start a business, then they can join like all the others that dropped out, like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, they, they all dropped out. You know? So, but, but generally, when you say you're going to drop out, they're not happy. So they said, well, why don't you just continue in school and you can do your Hare Krishna stuff, you know, just live outside. And that college town was so degraded, my thought was, if I am not with the devotees 24-7, I can't do it. So there was like no doubt in my mind. And it's really interesting, and I think about this, maybe Sri Bhanganana, you have the same experience. It's like, for such a young person, so conditioned, you would think if they began the practice of Krishna consciousness, they would have a really difficult time because they never lived that way. You know, getting up early, following the principles, doing service all day, you think, how can you do that? You never did that. And I think about those days, and I, I, I try to remember did I have difficulty? And I don't remember having any difficulty. And I should have had a lot of difficulty. Just coming off the street, 19, you know, the, that, that life, that hippie life, that, that was like, this town was like one of the hippie capitals in America. So coming out of that, and that's going on all around you, like the whole community is doing that, and then you move in and you, you're a sadhu now, 19 years old. No illicit sex, no gambling, no intoxication, no eating. You get up at 4 o'clock. I used to go to bed at 3 a.m. Now I'm getting up at 4 a.m. This is a total switch, right? And I look back and I think of those days and I think, did I have any difficulty? And I keep thinking, I think, no, I didn't. <laughs> Why? What were we doing? We'd get up, kirtan, japa, class, breakfast, clean the temple, go on the street, kirtan, come home, lunch, go back on the street, kirtan, come back, class, go back out, kirtan. Like, like how could you have trouble with that? You're completely surrounded by the holy name and sangha. So I think that's a really good example of how the power of sangha, that you can take somebody at, at, in that position who has no samskar background for that, and they can do that. <clears throat> there were people in those days not all the time, but there were people who would come to the temple. They didn't know anything about Krishna consciousness, and they would never leave. They go, I like this. I want it. Can I stay here? And in that sangha, the next day, <laughs> they're wearing a saffron dhoti, shaved head and tilak, and they're doing the whole program. And the day before, <laughs> they didn't know anything. Never read Bhagavad Gita. How could that happen? That's the power of sangha. So, uh, I want to share a, a very important point about Sangha. It's not discussed all the time, but sometimes we're challenged, not sometimes, we're all challenged with some obstacles in our life, some conditioning, some, some way we want to behave that is not natural for us, but we want to behave that way or something we want to give up, something we want to take, do, something we want to give up. 
but on our own, we don't have the strength. So how does Sangha come to our rescue there? You might say, I cannot give this up. But what you can do is put yourself in a Sangha, in an environment which would cause you to give it up. So on your own, you, your willpower is not strong enough to give it up, but your willpower can be used to be in the Sangha that would cause you to give it up. Does that make sense? Like you can, like, what you want to do, create the sangha that's going to, it's like the wind behind yourselves, create the sangha, the association that'll move you that way. Or what you want to give up, create that sangha that will help you give it up. So, so even if you feel, I'm too weak to give it up, you can still create a sangha that would support you. There is a, a very interesting system I learned, and if you would like to adopt this, you can. It's called the buddy system. It's really interesting. Would you like to hear it? Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Okay, I'm going to tell you. So, let's say Steve, let's say Steve decides, I want to do blank, or whatever blank is, you know, chant 98 rounds tomorrow or whatever. I'm going to chant this number of rounds, I'm going to follow these, whatever Steve wants to do. He makes a buddy with his partner, what's your name? Uh, Asha. Asha. So you decide to be buddies. And so, so, so Steve says to Asha, I want you to call me every evening at 8.30 and ask me, let's say Steve wants to chant four rounds, and say, and ask me, did you chant four rounds? And let's say Steve wants to get up at 5.30. So Steve tells Asha, ask me, did I get up at 5.30? Let's say Steve wants to read Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita every day for for a half hour, or he can even give a time. And so Steve says to Asha, ask me, did you read Bhagavad Gita? And he makes his whole list of what he wants to do every day. And he knows at 8.30 in the evening, Asha is going to call him, and he doesn't want to go down the list and go, no, no, <laughs> no. So it's a system to take maybe your weaknesses or to ensure that you do something that maybe you wouldn't do on your own, but if there's another person aware of it who's going to ask you, obviously you want to say yes, because you're the one who gave him the list, right? What do you think of that? It's, just, it's, a, way, it's a way to use Sangha, you know, just like buddy system, you know, to help you. This is what I want to do. Accountability partner, I'm going to have to and I'm the one who gave him the questions. It's not like he's making them up. So, um, There's another aspect of, um, of Sangha that's really interesting. It has been said, and I think we all have this experience, that environment is stronger than willpower. So I have a willpower to do something, but if the environment is not conducive, that environment can overpower me. And um, so it goes along with the point I was making before. You, you want to, whatever you want to do, you need to create an environment that supports it. And a lot of us try to do something, but we allow ourselves to be in an environment that's antagonistic, right? And so we, we struggle to do it, but we don't create an environment that would support it. So, but the interesting thing is, Sometimes we blame the environment on our weakness. We say, well, if I wasn't in this environment, then I could do it. But we're the ones who created the environment that we're complaining about. Yes? You ever have that experience? I'm complaining about an environment that's making it difficult for me to do what I want to do, but I'm the one who created the environment. So, and it's like, it's like, oh, my office is so messy, I can't concentrate. Well, who messed your office up? Right? And if your office is messy, why can't you concentrate? Because you've got a messy mind, which is why you have a messy office. And if you, like, clean your office, maybe your mind will clean up. Hari Sari, I was told, said that when he was writing the Prabhupada memories, the first thing he would do before he would write would clean his room. He'd clean it, get everything, because he felt that was the environment he needed to be in to be able to be clear and to be writing. Isn't that interesting? So... We, we can create the environment that's antagonistic, which is foolish, right? We want to create the environment which will support us. And then I had another interesting, it's, it's kind of like a hack, but 
I have a recording studio, and, and you know, I have some projects I work on, but I do other things that I feel are like way more important than recording. And like, but I have everything. It's a nice studio, and, and I just like can't get in there because there's always something. You ever have that? Like, you, I want, I want to do this. I promise myself, and years go by, and you just can't find the time. Even though you can find the time to scroll, you can't find the same <laughs> amount of time it takes to scroll to do that. Yeah. And I was reading in a recording magazine where this person said, I make an appointment, like you make appointments with people to do something. He said, I make appointments with myself. Like, like on Wednesdays from 8 to 9 p.m., I have an appointment in my studio with myself. So that's that's like creating an environment that will support you. And in fact, there's a book called Triggers, which is a whole book about the reason that we often fail is because there are triggers in our life that cause us to go the up in the opposite direction we want to go, things which trigger us. And I, I didn't read the book, or maybe I did. I can't remember. It was given to me to like review, give feedback. So I don't know if I read the whole thing or not. But I think the obvious conclusion is have triggers in your life that trigger you to do what you want, not triggers that trigger you to do what you don't want, because we're weak. And so the, the assumption of sangha is that we're weak, and the assumption is that we need environments which will help us go in the direction we want to go. And we need people around us who exhibit the qualities we want to have. So uh, there's a devotee named Jayananda Prabhu by some inconceivable fortune and mercy of Krishna. I had Jayananda Prabhu's association. Jayananda Prabhu, Jayananda Prabhu was known in our move, movement as a saint. Like, no, we never called anyone a saint. Like in Catholicism, you, you get sainthood. Few people rare, rarely get sainthood, but it happens. But it never happened officially, and I don't know how it happened at ISKCON. But I think in Mayapur, it, it, on his samadhi, it says, the, does, it, does anyone remember? The first saint in ISKCON. Does anyone remember if it says that? It does, yeah. The first saint in ISKCON. He's like, and so, I never met anyone as transparent as Jayananda. Like, he did not have false ego. It didn't exist in him at all. He was the most humble um, person. What you see is what you get. There was no show. It was just genuine. Prabhu, I'm just a mercy case. Prabhupada, I'm, I'm nothing. And, and everyone's in awe that he's so great and he's always saying, I'm nothing. So. My experience with being with Jayananda, I'm this, I'm this little, you know, I met him when I was just as first a devotee, still 19 years old. So, you know, when you're 19 years old, you're all full of yourself, you know. Like, you know I'm a devotee, I'm better than everybody. Who knows, you know, and I got Gayatri, you know, joined in January, got Gayatri when I was like in August. And so when I got my Gayatri, it was like, well, that like upgraded my, you know, pride levels, you know. Significantly, I could sit there, you know. Instead of chanting Gayatri, I would think, oh, look, everybody, check me out, I'm a Brahmin. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's what you do when you're 19, 20, right? Isn't it? <laughs> sit up straight, look like a yogi, you know, impress everybody. So, um, it was impossible to become proud in the association of Jayananda because he was without false ego. And, and, and from that experience, I developed a power secret of Sangha I want to share with you. And this is also, I mean, it's there in our Shastra. But I have found that whatever quality I'm lacking, I will search out someone who has it and just hang with them. And just by being around them, that quality, by osmosis, it's like all I have to do is be around them. You ever have that experience? You just around somebody and you start to feel like they feel and think like, like you imagine, at least you're thinking more like they, at least, at least you're not thinking like you were thinking before. You must be thinking more like them. You could just, 
you know, sometimes um, I remember one time we were uh, in Los Angeles uh, taking prasadam, and one devotee was like, he was having trouble, he was overeating. And he said, he said, I need to sit next to Jaya Dvaita Swami because he doesn't eat much. <laughs> I said, that's a good idea, right? You know, like, or just get a smaller plate and smaller spoons, you know. Um, but when you associate with someone who has the qualities you want, you can imbibe them, and that's the power of Sangha. And science has proven this, that you, you, you are, there's an energy field that surrounds every person, electromagnetic energy, from the heart and the mind. And different energy, I think, from the mind and the heart. But we pick up on it. And I was just reading yesterday, or hearing, like, you ever think of somebody just out of the blue? It's just like, yeah. You know what they say? It may be because they were thinking of you, that you're thinking of them. It's possible, right? Yeah, I was just thinking of, yeah, I was thinking of you too. Yeah. Well, who was first, chicken or the egg, maybe? So <laughs> we're, um, and so Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, if you're having trouble with chanting, you want to improve your chanting, chant with somebody who's pure and sit next to them and you'll, you'll get their vibration. So in my personal experience, if I've ever been challenged with something that I am having great difficulty overcoming, it's just really, you know, those, you tried, you failed, you tried, you failed, you tried, you failed. You come to the point, it's like, what's the use? I've tried so many times. You ever have that experience? It's like, this is just how I am, I can't change. Power user's secret. Find a person who's not like that and hang with them. You don't have to do anything else. You just have to be in their association. And it will change your heart. That's the power of Sangha. It can actually change your heart. I had this experience. I was, I was struggling. I was struggling with a, a very deep attachment that I couldn't shake. For maybe like a year, it was almost, almost like I was depressed. And then I met this sannyasi, and he told me one sentence, and it shattered that attachment that I've been <laughs> hanging on to for one year. In one sentence, it was gone forever. <laughs> so sometimes it's like that. Just associating with someone who's not on the same wavelength as we are. They're in another wavelength. They don't see it how we see it. Oh, come on, that's just this and that. Why bother with it? Oh, okay. The Prabhupada used to do that also. The Prabhupada's famous, what is the difficulty? You'd have a problem and he'd say, but this, that, and that, what's the difficulty? And you'd say, uh, I guess there isn't any difficulty. It was, like, it was like gone. And so we had experience when we'd see Prabhupada, Prabhupada would often come and do what is called an arrival address. You know, he'd come from the airport, come in the temple, or wherever, you, wherever you'd bring him, and he would say something. That's the arrival address. And often he would say, is everybody happy? Because Prabhupada, his mission was to make everyone happy, and he just wanted to see people happy, so he would often say, is everybody happy? Or maybe he knew they were happy, and just you know, wanted to say it, to, you know, just like sweeten it up. And our experience was, even if we weren't happy, now that we saw Prabhupada, we were happy. Just by him coming in that Sangha, like everything changed by the... So we, we all have that experience, or many of us have that experience, of s associating with a very elevated person, how that brings us up, just like, boom, right, from nowhere. Would you like to hear a beautiful story? This is about seeing Prabhupada and Bhukta distribution. Would you like to hear it? So, I have a godbrother. I have a godbrother. Well, uh, for those of you who are watching outside, we're having a heat spell in England. It's as warm as it is at 8 a.m. in the morning in Alaska. That's the heat spell. <laughs> the high temperature today is like what it is when we wake up in Alaska. We're having a heat spell here. So, um, 
<laughs> some air or something. Yeah. We're blowing air in here. Cool. Uh, yeah. It's hot for you, right? Yeah. 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 I can't take it. It's, yeah. My daughter and I were in Ireland. It was like 19 degrees. And uh, people were complaining. They're having heat spell. And well, it's like, it's so hot. I can't take it. We're <laughs> just laughing. It's not even that cool in the summer in Alaska. It doesn't even get that to 19 in the morning. It's just like 22 or something, 23. Anyway, so, so this devotee told me, this is the day Prabhupada's coming into the airport. And I said, well, you, are you going to greet Prabhupada at the airport? Because we would all go to the airport and greet Prabhupada. Because in those days, there was no security. So we were just like, you imagine? 300 devotees at the airport. <laughs> oh, kirtan. And big umbrella over Prabhupada's head. And Prabhupada's coming in and flowers. I think in one place they might have thrown yogurt on the floor. I don't know. But we didn't clean up the mess. We just throw the flowers. Prabhupada comes in. And, and, then, and then we'd all go back to the temple. A few people would stay back at the temple. And, and, but everyone else would go. You meet Prabhupada. And you've seen, you've seen the videos and like that. So I asked this devotee, this book distributor, I said, are you coming back? And he said, no, I'm going to stay and distribute 108 big books. I said, really? How are you going to do that? He said, I just need to see Prabhupada for a few seconds. And once I see him, I'll be able to do it. And that evening, he came back and I said, did you do 108 big books? He said, of course I did. I saw Prabhupada. So that's the power uh, of Sangha, that we can get, sometimes, sometimes when we want to do something, we're just lacking the motivation. It's not that we can't do it, isn't it? It's just like, you know, it's like, we can do so many things, but I don't feel like, I, don't I doubt myself, and I don't know, whatever. So this example, I think, is so beautiful that, that he saw Prabhupada, and just by seeing him, that was all he needed. And that gave him the inspiration that he couldn't otherwise have had on his own. And this is also interesting. Prabhupada would come to America after, after 1970. In, before 1972, Prabhupada spent a lot of time, especially in Los Angeles, and I was there. So in 1970, Prabhupada spent seven months in Los Angeles. Did you know that? Seven months in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Temple, which is a 20-minute walk from the house I was born in. Wow. How fortunate could I be? 1972, I didn't live there in 1970, but 1972, I lived there, and Prabhupada was there for three months. But after that, come back for a week. You know, so you know, if, you were on, if you were near Los Angeles, you'd go, and then you'd go to various big temples in America. So our Sangha with Prabhupada, and I'm sure it was the same for you here, our Sangha was generally one week a year. In some temples, three days. In some temples, one day. And if you ask any of the devotees, they will tell you, that's all I needed to keep me going for the whole year. I just needed those few days. Isn't it? Yeah, I'm good. A few days with a pure devotee, heart surgery, you know, inspiration, everything's good. So that's the power of Sangha. Now, you might say, well, that's Prabhupada, uh, and that's true. But Prabhupada's rep we're all Prabhupada's representatives. And so I think, you know, the greatest gift that Prabhupada created was devotees, because we need them, right? And every devotee's got something, isn't it? Like, every devotee's got some quality that I'm lacking. You think, oh, he's just a, he's just a new bhakta. We're losing our internet. Trying to reconnect. That's what it sounds like when I'm chanting bad job. Trying to reconnect a little so <laughs> My mind is gone all over. Uh, yeah, so um, the even the association of a new bhakta, you, you ever you ever meet a new devotee, like they're brand new and they're so sincere? And you're like, oh my God, I wish, I wish I had one 
quarter millionth of that sincerity. You ever feel like that? A new, new devotee, just that sincerity is powerful. That that sangha, all of the sangha, is powerful. And so that's iskon, iskon. You say, what is iskon? It's a sangha. Prabhupada created iskon for sangha. That's it. That we could come together and inspire one another. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Sri Bhagavananda wants to say something. If I may. Please. Srila Prabhupada quotes in, uh, in the Nectar of Devotion. I uh, don't know how to turn this on. Hare um, Krishna. Hmm. In the next of devotion, Prabhupada quotes from Srimad Bhagavatam, which quotes Hiranyas Nashapu. Oh, yeah, right. And Hiranyas Nashapu, he says, association is everything. And he says, just like the crystal stone, which reflects everything around it, that is the power of association. Hmm. Yes, exactly. What a good example. That if I hang out with you, I'll become like you. If you hang out with me, you'll become like me. Therefore, if you're not married yet, understand that when you get choose wisely who you want to marry, because you're going to become like them. Because you're hanging with them all the time, right? <laughs> you will become like them. So make sure you want to become like that, because you will become like that. That's something to consider. And if you're already married, you're like, oh, damn, I wish I would have thought that. You know, only kidding. But. <laughs> but you know, if you're married, it's like how much you become. And your children become like you. This is so important. You know, there's one devotee. Um, he used to be in our movement. He has his own movement now. And he said something very wise. He said he studied child psychology and, you know, how the parent psychology affects the child and, you know, those first years of raising a child. And his conclusion was, he said, I think we need to teach adults before they have children how their up raising of their children affects them, what, what is good, what is bad, etc. And not allow them, give them permission to have children only after they pass the course. Because if you are not a healthy individual, you don't have proper understanding, your association could damage your children. Right? So, you know, it's like we are association for our children, for one another, and so it's just a reality. And those people are like Sri Bhagavananda said, like Hiranyakashipu said, they're reflecting. They're just reflecting who we are around, what we're around. And, and also, with the modes of nature, three modes of nature. You go into a Thomistic environment, what does it do to you? Obviously, it, if, you, know, you start feeling the lower modes, right? How do you feel when you listen to rap music? <laughs> if you say, I feel inspired, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll need to talk a little more. <laughs> I, I, I have my joke. Rap is like, there's, there's, Krishna says there are three modes of nature. He made a mistake. There's actually four. The fourth mode is rap. <laughs> Hip hop is the fourth mode. Yeah. Um, but you know what I'm saying. I was just having fun here. I, I don't want to offend any, any of you who like hip hop. But you know what we're saying. <laughs> Things come with modes. Foods come with modes. You know, we're, we're affected by this. We're very affected by it. Environments, you know. It's like we're social creatures. We're, we're just affected by it. And so when you want to be Krishna conscious, you have to be more sensitive to the environments you allow yourself to be in and the environments you create at home. Because, as we said, the environment you create, it creates you, right? Doesn't it? Hare Krishna. So anyone have comments or questions? Or clar need for clarification? Or, yeah? Yes. So you were a Prabhupada's disciple. So we were talking about association. If I were to associate with Prabhupada for one day, what would be the one most important quality that you would like me or that I should take from Prabhupada? Um, Can you give an example? Or um, you, well, you know, this is an interesting question because 
when we associate it with Prabhupada, we, we may have had a desire to develop certain qualities, but at the same time, certain qualities just came to us. And I can say from my own experience, when I was with Prabhupada, and maybe you had the same experience, I just wanted to give everything to him. Just like, take me. You know, like, just exploit me. I'm your slave. That's how I felt. I just want to, do you feel that way also? I just want to give everything to you. It wasn't even like I was asking for that. That's just like, I want to give everything to you. I want to make the world Krishna conscious. Throw me in a van, you know. I'll eat granola for the next three months. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Just fill it up with books and send me out. That's how I felt. So, so um, of course, we could pray. Um, we would often pray, you know, like, Prabhupada, let me represent your mission. It, it may be individual. I would say one of, one of the things that I believe we should pray for is, Prabhupada, let my life be an example of your teachings. Let people understand what you're teaching when they see me, when they, when they associate with me. I think that's like the essence, you know, because, because it is said, you know, fam it was famously said, I don't know about who, I, I teach all day, and e in the evening sometimes I speak. So I'm exemplifying, in this case, the teachings of Jesus in my life. And that's my greatest teaching, and sometimes I might speak those teachings. So to me, well, what's, what could be better than if every one of us, every one of our lives was an example of Prabhupada's teaching? Like, like, like I often say, if you invited a friend to live with you, and you didn't say anything to them, would they understand Krishna consciousness just by observing you? Would they understand, you know? Or would they just see you and think you're like everybody else, right? It's, in a, it's interesting, isn't it, to think about. Like, I can't, I can't, your friend's coming over, you can't tell them anything, but they'll see your life. What will they see? Will they see Prabhupada's teachings? You know, sometimes we have a problem. Sometimes someone becomes a devotee, they become... Um, what I call a spiritual paradox. Instead of becoming more humble, they become more proud. So it's like the opposite happens. Have you seen that? It's like, it should go, instead of becoming nicer, they become harsher. Instead of becoming more timid, they become more angry. A, a priest, a monk, tells a story. He went home. He's a Catholic monk. He went home, and he was praying in the morning, and his mother, you know, while he's praying, went, I brought you a little coffee. Okay, leave it there. Then. Ten minutes later, brought you some biscuits. Okay, you know, you know, he's praying. And then, like the third time, brought you some water. Can't you leave me alone? Don't you see I'm praying? So, like, you know, like, you understand, right? Like, exact opposites can come. So, uh, Prabhupada wanted us to be gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that's what he said. He wanted, you know, when... Why I first went to India, Prabhupada said, your preaching in India is to act like a perfect lady and gentleman because people will see that and they'll think, oh, this Krishna consciousness is real. And they will think, your pure spiritual master must be pure, otherwise how is it that you're pure? So you will glorify me by acting properly. And we know we definitely don't glorify Prabhupada if we don't act properly, right? We, in a sense, we defame him. You Hare Krishna as you do this and that. We want people to say, you Hare Krishnas are wonderful because you do this and that. That's what I would pray for. What would you, you want to say something, Sri Bhandi, about being with Prabhupada? Being with Prabhupada was always extraordinary because we learned so much just from the little things that Prabhupada yeah. came yeah. up with. And I remember seeing one photo in which he exhibited that so nicely because you'd see in a morning walk conversation there would be devotees behind Prabhupada listening and you know, Prabhupada would come out of something it just it's so <laughs> blindingly obvious but we just completely missed all our lives and it just suddenly rocketed home uh, it was extraordinary yeah. powerful and it just changed everything. I had, yeah, I had one of those. Yeah. In, in uh, Los Angeles, they built a little garden, like they have a parking lot, and they, they, they took a section of the parking lot, 
put a fence around it, planted grass and flowers and like that. And that's where you'll see Prabhupada in his garden. And sometimes we would go in the building next to the garden on the second floor and we could look in and Prabhupada would talk, was talking. And uh, one day, it's like probably 1975 or 76, probably 75, Prabhupada's in the garden, and I just, I hear, I hear, I'm like, oh. So I peek through. As soon as I peek through, Prabhupada said, so, there are birds, birds, he said birds, there are birds that fly from planet to planet, and they hatch eggs, and in space, the eggs hatch. And that's what I heard. I said, okay. An example, like, all right, that was a new one. <laughs> yes, and I was in Los Angeles when Prabhupada. I was on a walk, and he said, "You know, when I was a kid, you know the movie Godzilla. I saw the movie Godzilla, and they made some models, and they used cotton, little cotton balls for clouds. You call cotton balls cotton balls? I never know what you call them." Cotton wool, yeah. Cotton wool for uh, clouds, and this is explaining. He said, so, similarly, the moon landing, very easy to, you know, <laughs> just like blowing everyone's minds. He said, Prabhupada, where they, they landed, where, they, where, they, where the moon landing was, it looked like Arizona, because Arizona's flat desert. He goes, it looks like it? Where do you think it was then? <laughs> So, you know, it's like, okay, you know, whatever you think, you know, just like, like you say, just say something like, okay, take that home with you. And then, right after the walk, I was on the walk, right after the walk, Prabhupada sits down in class and says, so, so why do you think Monday comes after Sunday? And he said, because sun, moon, and Tuesday is what, Mars, Wednesday, something. Mercury. Mercury. Thursday, Jupiter. Yeah. Something like that. Friday and Saturday, Saturn. Yeah. So, okay. That was the beauty of being with Prabhupada, that he would say things that would <sighs> shake your universe up. And he's explaining that the days of the week were all formally on the calendars, starting with Sunday, because the days of the week, like that, named after yeah, yeah. are ordered in terms of proximity to the earth. Sun being closest, yeah. then the moon, and the dictionary definition of Saturn is the furthest planet. Wow. From the sun oh, from the wow. Earth. Interesting. Interesting, yeah. Hmm. But now they changed it, so Monday was his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Prabhupada had fun, you know, sometimes he would just play, just to make a point that we're limited, we can't really know these things. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone has a question, comment? Well, I think one thing I should emphasize, I didn't emphasize this enough, and then we'll ask. We were talking about how to take association, and I was making the point that we're also association. So I think it's, it's always important to understand that my presence is association. Whether I like it or not, it is. So, you know, they say, leave somebody better than you found them. You know, it's just like a Brahmin. Bra wherever a Brahmin goes, he leaves the place cleaner than he found it. So I always think, well, we could use that with people. Leave people cleaner than you found them, right? Leave people better than you found them. But we are association, so what we do, what we say, what we're even feeling and thinking is affecting people around us. And so if we're, if we're you'll, you'll find if you're Krishna conscious, you'll have a very powerful effect. And people will say, oh, I feel very Krishna conscious in your association. And you may wonder why I didn't do anything. I just sat here and took prasadam or something. It's because your consciousness is, 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 is affecting people around you. So part of our job as devotees is, is, is not just to work on ourselves for ourselves, but to work on ourselves for the benefit of others. 
Yes. Okay. Prabhu, you're up. It's your turn. Prabhu, can you uh, share your thoughts on this? Um, we we come into the association of devotees, and it's it's very easy. It it flows. Our doubts, our concerns, our challenges—they're kind of almost disappear. And then, of course, we have to leave the association of devotees and do stuff in the world. Um, and then when it comes to making a decision again to come back into the association of the Yodis, we, we, we doubt again. We, we have this hesitation, this inertia, this, um, uh, this almost feeling that I don't want to be back in that association. But as soon as we're in the association, we're very, mm, we're, we're very happy to be in the association. So how do we overcome that? Wow. Let me ask you, what's the hesitancy that, like, I'll have to, if I go into association, I'll have to be Krishna conscious, and I'm, like, it's like, I don't actually feel like being that Krishna conscious, something like that? Yeah, as in, we, we have to be real, and, and other times, we don't have to be <laughs> Well, I think you just answered the question. Is I don't want to be real, <laughs> isn't it? I want to. I mean, it's true. It's true. Whenever, whenever you're in association, it's like it's like now you get to see yourself because you, in comparison to those who are more Krishna conscious, I'm looking pretty bad. I I have an experience. Often, I once went to a class, and this devotee was like for every three or four sentences he quoted a verse. And a lot of those verses I didn't know, or a lot of those verses I used to know and forgot. You know. And there's two feelings. One feeling is I feel really guilty that I have, haven't kept up with my verses, or I don't quote as many verses as him. The other feeling, which I, I prefer to have and I try to have, is what an inspiration to learn the verses. So... I think that might be part of it, right? That, you know, now I'm seeing how bad I am, but, you know, if I don't associate with somebody better, I won't know how bad off I am. But we need that to, you know, to, to, to help us calibrate, oh, I'm off. I can see how off I am by being with you. I was, I took prasadam with one sannyasi, and he was like going over, he was like he was playing a game. So it was one of his disciples would say, 12 6, and he would quote the verse. 13, 7, you know, 9, 4, and you quote the verse, and he was like knocking them out, you know, and missed like one out of like 25 verses, and I missed like half of them. And I mean, I knew the verses, but I didn't know the numbers, or a few of them I, but it was like, it was like just being like, oh yeah, I need to do that more. You know? So if you take it in a positive way, yeah, like I need it, and not take it in a, you know, false ego, guilty, shaming way, then you know what's going to happen when you go to the temple. You know it'll be good for you. So the question is, can your false ego handle it, or are you not in a mood to like do the work or something? I think you need to answer that question more than I do. But I think you did answer it already by asking it. Yes? More or less? That's a good question. <coughs> You, you see another devotee and you see how Krishna conscious they are and it can make you feel bad. Like, I'm, I'm a mess, right? Or it can inspire you. She has a question. And I hope, I hope it can inspire us. I hope it can inspire us. Yeah. I mean, we can, be, you know, we can allow it to... So if I'm feeling that guilt and this and that, can you switch it? Can you turn it over and say, no... I should be inspired by this. You know, a lot of times we become envious of someone. And, and Prabhupada said, it's so interesting, he said, you are only envious of someone that you appreciate. Because yeah. you're not envious of the trash collectors and street sweepers, I don't think. Are you? Uh, I'd love to be a street sweeper. I'm so envious of them. No. <laughs> if someone drives up in a really nice car to a really nice house and, you know, a really nice suit. And, you know, I'm envious of you. You have more money than I do. You're more successful. 
The Prabhupada said, actually, you're appreciating them. So you, you can flip it. So I feel envy, but actually I think, well, actually, it's only because I appreciate what you have, because I want it. So then I flip it into appreciation. And so the association of the person who's causing you to be envious can also inspire you. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So interesting. Yes? Yeah. As an overall general <laughs> principle that I try to follow myself is to not allow anything to cause me to become negative, even if it is. And so it's kind of, it's almost like a challenge. Like how, how could I either not be negatively impacted by this? Like how, how can I have a shield, so to speak, so that I won't allow my mind to get distracted by it. Or, is there a way I could see, uh, possibly see it in a positive way? Now, I, I think, I personally think sometimes with negative people, the way I can see it positively, even though it's not positive, is to understand their trouble. Like, like, what's their backstory of why they're doing that? Because I think some people, for me, will always be negative. For them, it's normal. It's like, no, that's just how it is. That's their life, their culture, their upbringing, whatever. And once I understand that, then it's like, oh, okay. That's just how they, as we say in America, that's just how they roll. You know, it's like, they're, you know, they're rude. They're abrasive, but they don't know that because that's how their family is. You know, they talk loud and you know, nasty. And so I think that helps also. Um, one of the things, and I was saying that in class when I gave class whenever I did on Saturday, that I, I have found it's extremely important to figure out how to remain positive, enthusiastic, no matter what situation I'm in. Like, and so. It's kind of like I could throw this question back to you. Like, the question to you is, how can you remain positive and enthusiastic even when the situation is negative? And I'm pretty convinced that if you think about it long enough, Krishna will reveal how to do that. Because it's a survival technique. We have to be. We have to be positive. Um, Prabhupada said, and so many people said, you cannot be successful if you're not enthusiastic. It's impossible. So, so understanding that, when Prabhupada said that, he said, like, enthusiasm is everything in Krishna. Utsahan is the first principle. Enthusiasm is everything. And as I said in that class, Prabhupada said determination is just a byproduct of enthusiasm. How, is important, how important is determination? Very important. But it depends on enthusiasm. So you having heard, I heard Prabhupada said that you know everything depends on enthusiasm. Without enthusiasm, you'll fail. And when he said that, it was like, okay, that's a pretty powerful statement. So that means I have to figure out how to be enthusiastic even when I'm not enthusiastic. I have to figure out how to be positive even when I'm not. I have to figure out how can I shrug off the negativity that that I'm surrounded by if I am so I don't bring it home and it doesn't enter my japa the next day and my work the next day. And I think it's a question we all have to ask ourselves. I heard something that, if, that helped me with this once. That if you think about something you don't like long enough, you'll become discouraged. If you don't believe me, you can experiment. 
I don't suggest you experiment, but <laughs> if you do experiment, maybe you've already experimented with it. Ever thought about like pop the elections coming up and think about the party or the person that you don't like long enough? You'll be like, what's the use of voting? You know, these, you know, especially if you don't like both candidates. I don't know about here, but in America, a lot of people don't like both candidates. And so if you think about it long enough, it's like, this is really discouraging. So anything that you meditate on that's negative, at least negative for you, and you meditate it long enough, it can just undermine your enthusiasm. So um, I, think, I think part of the answer to this is we need enough positive things in our life that the negative doesn't really, you know, it's like, uh, it doesn't do much. You know? It's when you don't have enough positive, then the negative is like, you know, percentage-wise, it's just a little thing. If I have a lot of positive, it remains a little thing. But if I don't, that little thing is now half of my everything in my consciousness. So I think, yeah, I mean, look at, if you look at, um, I was just, I was staying with Shai Mahari, and he's a disciple, Radhana Swami. And I'm dealing with some issues with my disciples, you know, where some devotees are not getting along with certain disciples, you know, and it just bothers me, you know, it's like, you, go, you have to tell them, you know, don't associate, they tell them not to write you, and you're just kind of like, oh, this is not nice, and, you know. Um, and it's always, you know, and then I'm thinking, but he has like, oh, I don't know, a hundred times more disciples than I have. Like, you know, he doesn't look like <laughs> a negative person, <laughs> an unhappy person. It's like, how does he do that? We know how he does it. He's filling his cup up with nec so much nectar that this stuff is like, it's just like it slides off him. Like, yeah, it's not a problem, isn't it? He's like so positive and so absorbed and full of nectar. Otherwise, how can you do it, right? So I think um, that was been my thought because I had to deal with some things lately that I didn't want to deal with. It's just not palatable, and you know, and I. And I was thinking, you know, a lot of our emotions and feelings are, are very subconscious and they're like, we can be feeling really bad and negative and we're not even aware of it and it's really unhealthy. And when these things happen, I realize that for days it's just like I, I feel uneasy. Um, but then if I'm absorbed in Krishna consciousness, it's like these things become like they're not that, it's like, yeah, we can deal with this, it's not, it's not such a big thing. So I think... I think that's extremely important. But I would go back just to the question of like, ask yourself how you can find ways to remain enthusiastic and positive. Because if we're not, it's the worst place to be, just for so many reasons. Isn't it? And then, I mean, of course, we could give a talk on gratitude, appreciation, appreciating the person, they're trying. You know. um, Some of the most negative people have, still they have good qualities. If you, if you pull it out of that context and just, you know. Anyway, that's something. I don't know if it's the complete answer, but it's something. Yes. Yes. Yeah, please. It comes down to the story of when the last time something that was a very powerful experience. It was at the time when Prabhupada came in the 77 uh, to Mumbai, mm. to Twin Towers. Uh, Prabhupada's rooms weren't ready at the time. Mm -hmm. And so the devotees were taking Prabhupada to a hotel and Prabhupada said, no, I'm, I'm staying in my room. And Prabhupada said, no, if they're not ready now, then Prabhupada came down in the morning, although he was very, very ill, and he came down on his palanquin, uh, carried by some devotees, because he couldn't, couldn't walk properly. Yeah. And we had Guru Puja in the morning. And after the Guru Puja, Prabhupada asked, so what is the gift of the spiritual master? And I remember I 
like to answer something and I felt that he said no the gift of the spiritual master just like you're singing in the guru puja prayers be you again be you perfect in prayer so this is the gift of the spiritual master be you again transcendental knowledge and then he said if you always remember that that he's not giving material knowledge he's giving spiritual knowledge he said then you'll always be able to remain obliged to mm. the spiritual master mm. and that obligation somehow or other keeps us going in the spiritual life uh, because we know Prabhupada's giving us the greatest thing and if we always keep connecting with that Bidya Gyan that Prabhupada's giving us then it becomes much much easier to always feel focused and positive and alive in Krishna consciousness thank you and I, I could add to that one thing you, you reminded me now we can think based on what you just said, we do not have a right not to be enthusiastic. And we don't have a reason or a right. You know. And so, at one time Prabhupada said, when the devotee was discouraged, Prabhupada said, you, you have no right to be discouraged, like you have no reason. I have a reason to be discouraged. No help from my God brothers. And so, none of you have a reason. Look at look what you have. I said, I have a reason, he said, but I'm never discouraged. It's like, when Prabhupada said, I'm never discouraged, I think what happened to me was it registered as like, Mahatma, you do not, Mahatma Das, you do not have a right to be discouraged. You see, Prabhupada has the right and he's not discouraged, so what right do you have? And um, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? And, and, and we, when we were with Prabhupada, we didn't want to, tell him, Prabhupada, I'm discouraged. Because he didn't want to hear that. Because it's like, you're discouraged. You have the holy name, you have prasadam, you have sangha, you have bhagavatam, you have sura. It's like, what's wrong with you? you know? We wanted to tell him what we were doing. Because that would make him happy. And so, it's like, he gives you everything and you're discouraged. It's like, mm, this is not good. Right? It's like, this is not good. And then, then you have... Bhaktivinoda Thakur, you know, difficulties, I relish, cherish difficulties because it, it gives me like this opportunity to serve Krishna. You know, it's like, a, it's like, if there's an opportunity to show love, sometimes the best moments to show it are in the most difficult times when you can, you can show up for your lover in a difficult time and make a sacrifice and you feel wonderful that I was able to do that. Isn't it? It's almost like you think, thank you for allowing me to go through this difficulty. And I was go in a temple, I was asked to go to a temple and help with the difficulty. And the difficulty was just like miserable. It was just horrible. It was the whole temple was shaken up. The temple president had turned against his guru. and It was a mess. And I went there, another GBC went there. It's like one of those situations, you know those situations? Whatever decision you make, it's still bad. You've ever been in one of those? It's like, we make this, half the people will kill you. Okay, well let's make this, the other half will kill you. You know, there's no good decision. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, thank you Prabhupada for giving me the opportunity to suffer for you, because if I didn't suffer for you, I'd just be suffering for myself. Isn't it? Or as you say, in it? <laughs> I would just be, you know, and so was, a lot of times when I'm going through stress and anxiety, I think, I went through all kinds of stress and anxiety for myself. <coughs> what a pleasure to do it for Prabhupada, you know, this is service. So yeah, like, yeah, it, it also, it almost like the negativity almost fosters, becomes a foundation for bliss. Because I can, you know, do this, make a sacrifice for, for my spiritual master. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. It's something like in government, you have perhaps, in good government, you have a loyal opposition. And they're coming to attack you, but the idea is that to make you stronger mm -hmm. and more effectual. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Yeah. We need difficulties. I don't, 
I, don't, I will not pray that you all run into difficulties, but we need them from time to time. And again, you get to show Krishna. Thank you, Krishna, for giving me the opportunity to show, to show you more devotion. I hate, I hate to fly in airplanes. It's like, you know, I always say it's like, I get an experience of what it's like to be a sardine. You know, when you get an airplane all cramped up, you know. It's, uh, and I always get the person who weighs like 400 kilos next to me, <laughs> occupies half my seat. You know, it's just because Krishna's like testing me. <clears throat> Thank you, Prabhupada, for you know giving me an opportunity to serve you in ways I don't want to. You know, that makes it more blissful. Right?